Hey, hi everyone. Uh, yep, so I'm going to do a talk on a brief introduction to image recognition. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so my name's Dan, uh, I'm from the UK, um, and I'm really into rock climbing and cycling outside of uh, doing this. Previous jobs I've had, uh, I've been a nurse for a few years and a train driver, now I'm a software engineer. So I'm enjoying it so far. Um, so I'd like to talk about image recognition. Um, what is an image? We see images uh, all, all the time, uh, they're everywhere. We see them on our phones, print media. Um, an image digitally is a visualization of a real life object in a 2D form, a collection of pixels um, that represent different colors. So a computer sees an image very differently to how we do. Uh, if this was fed into a computer, it would be a series of numbers. So we would see 0 to 256, for instance, for a uh, type of image. If it had more colour spaces, it would be more, more numbers. Um, image recognition involves actually analysing the pixels and the patterns within an image. And when we recognise an image, we can then identify core features uh, as a particular object. So why is it important? Why am I talking about this? There are a huge amount of applications. Um, it's, it's quite a happening field at the moment. Um, one of them is robotics. Um, increasingly, we're seeing robots which are able to identify different parts and warehouses and to use 3D vision and machine learning techniques to identify different parts and to pick them up, um, making warehouses more efficient. Um, another sector where this is going to be applied quite a lot is in healthcare, um, analysing test results, x-rays, feeding the images in and being able to identify problem areas um, that people may miss. So when you feed it into a computer, it tends to be a lot more accurate um, now than um, if it's just people. Um, autonomous vehicles, also uh, very uh, popular and growing at the moment. Um, image recognition is used for navigation um, and to sort of localise and identify different hazards. So when you're going down the road, the car is looking around using a camera to identify different things, uh, using image recognition to identify hazards. Um, so I'm going to go to the start, when this field started to be um, explored in more depth. Uh, this was 1959. There was a famous study done by Hubel and Weisel called Receptive Fields of Single Neurons in the Cat's Stryo Cortex. So, big name, but basically what they wanted to do is uh, analyse how, how um, a cat, uh, they use other animals as well, how a cat could see things. So they spent a few years anaesthetising these poor animals, um, putting a stimulus in front of them and then wiring electrodes up to their brains and then showing them different visual stimuli in the hope that they could get a response from them. Um, one day they were removing one of the slides which created a very sharp shadow across the screen and they managed to get an electrical signal back. Um, over time they did more studies on this and they worked out that different areas of the brain would fire for different patterns, different images that the animal was recognising. Uh, and this was applied to, um, they, they thought, maybe we can teach computers to see like this. Um, so I'm going to show a timeline now. Um, in 1959, we had the first digitally scanned image. We can see on the left, uh, this is an image of one of the researchers' um, children at three months old. So I was quite surprised at how high quality this image was in 1959. Um, uh, image recognition then became uh, more based on using geometric primitives, so different types of uh, shapes and corners and angles. Uh, and then in 1989, uh, they had been doing a lot of more research to apply machine learning techniques. And uh, the first convolutional neural net was used in 1989 to recognise handwritten zip codes. Um, I was quite surprised that that was so long ago. Uh, it's quite amazing. Um, in 2001, facial recognition became much better, and we're starting to see that everywhere at the moment. And then in 2010, uh, we started to see a lot more deep learning and convolutional neural network applications to identify things within images. Um, and in 2012, there was a massive breakthrough with AlexNet, which is quite a famous convolutional neural network 
um, it managed to increase its accuracy by uh, 9% over uh, the year before. Um, and after that, a lot of research, a lot of money was poured into using these convolutional neural networks to identify images. Um, so to actually see something in an image, we need to use feature detection. So techniques that rely on detecting actual features within an image. Uh, we can see over here, we've got sides, we've got edges, um, we've got shadows, we've got gradients. They're all key areas that we can look at to identify something. Um, and computers can be taught how to do that. Uh, I'm going to show a very simple e example. Uh, this is a Python script using OpenCV, which is a, a framework that you can use for Python. Um, can load an image in, which we do in line three, and run it through something called a Hoff gradient, which it, this one is looking for circles within an image. Um, so after running that, this is my output. So the computer managed to draw circles around uh, all the circles it found and identify those in an image. So this was really fast and worked really well, but it would be really tricky to apply this for all different shapes. It's very specific, has a very specific use case. Um, so this isn't a reliable way to detect for you know, complex geometrical objects. <laughs> so how do we see? Because I think it's important to cover this because neural networks and convolutional neural network are based upon how humans see. So when we look at something, we perceive the color, uh, the depth, and the sort of the form of uh, an object. Um, our brain then groups all of these together and kind of forms a structure which we then um, apply descriptive labels to. So if I looked at a chair, I might see different features of it. I might see the chair legs, uh, I might see the back of it, and then eventually kind of put that all together and I know it's a chair. And we do this all the time without even thinking about it. But for a computer to do it, it's quite tricky. Um, so uh, the researchers uh, looked at this and they thought, well, we can build something to, ident uh, to simulate how the human brain connects bits of images um, in this way. Um, neural networks aim to do this, so they take inputs they apply some complicated linear uh, equations and they aim to get outputs out. So uh, we can feed information into one, uh, it goes through the layer and we want to get predictions out of it. Um, I'm going to explain this in more depth with a convolutional neural network, which are the kind of the, the state of the art at the moment for image recognition. So firstly, we need to feed an image into the system in this example, we've got the number six, which I took from the famous data set. And if we zoom in, we can see that uh, each, each pixel has a different value. So um, there's a cluster here. Uh, the higher the value where well, they're clustered together, that tends to uh, indicate a feature or something specific about the image that we need to look at. Uh, this is a, maybe an easier example to look at. So here we have a picture of a dog bike and then there's a car in the background, uh, each of the main features of the image are grouped with the different colours. So once uh, an image has been fed into the system like this, uh, it goes through a convolution layer, which um, are, it is a, sorry, through a convolution layer, which aims to map specific features of an image. So imagine this is our image, we've then got a three by three square that would move along each pixel, and it would add all the value of all the pixels together, uh, apply some mathematical equation to it, and aim to get a result out. So we kind of downsample and get a, um, a variety of different numbers representing the edge or the feature that we're trying to see. And this happens for every single possible combination within that image. So we end up with a lot of layers Um, it then gets fed to something called a pooling layer, which takes the um, highest value from a small sector of the, the map and keeps it. So it gets kind of downsampled again. So we end up with very many layers, which we can see on the left, uh, with a number that represents the feature that they're trying to look at. We can have many, many, many of these layers feeding into each other. 
the ultimate aim is to get a different probability uh, for different sets of features so that eventually the model can tell you what it's looking at. Um, once that's all done, it goes to a fully connected layer where all the values are stacked and each value will connect to the answer that we want. And all of these values have weights. So one of these nodes might re represent, um, if we're looking at a picture of a dog, uh, the, the leg of the dog, we might have higher numbers for that specific part than down here. And then we can apply a sort of confidence into it to see uh, what we're looking at so it can tell us. So as I said, we can have many of these layers um, and combining them can really increase the accuracy of the network that we're using. So this is an easier way to look at it. We have our convolution layer that we talked about earlier, our pooling layer, another convolution, another pooling, keeps going on. Um, and eventually you end up with our fully connected layers. So we can get predictions at the end. So in order to do this, we actually need to be able to train it. So we need to be able to teach the network about what it's seeing. Um, we can feed it images and it will work out what it's looking at, but we need to be able to actually tell it if it's looking at the right things. So during training with one of these, we would feed it an image with labels and then you can test how accurate it is. Um, in practice, this isn't done a huge amount. People tend to use networks that have already been made. Um, so they do this using transfer learning, which is where you can use the pre-trained models. Um, there's a massive advantage here because making a model, you need a huge amount of data. Your data sets need to be really big in order to make it accurate. By using pre-trained models, um, you give your system a better ability to be able to generalize about what it's looking at. And it can take less time to get much better results. So this is an example I explored when using uh, doing this project. Um, I used a Jupyter notebook uh, running Python. And I loaded a pre-trained convolutional neural net called ResNet34, which is quite famous and is quite good. And um, that has 34 different layers. Um, the aim of this was to sort out different cat and dog breeds. So I used a open data set. I think it's published by uh, Oxford University. Uh, it has a variety of all these different dog breeds, many pictures of them. The aim is to just separate out and see which ones we can see. Um, so during training, it took me quite a long time to do this on my laptop. Um, each run through, though, I was getting a smaller and smaller error rate, meaning that it was working quite well, and the learning rate was getting quicker as well. Um, ended up with a confusion matrix, which is a big grid of all the different breeds um, going down here, and then you'd have them along there. Uh, and if the breeds line up with each other and have a high number, you've got quite a good uh, a quite high amount of accuracy. Um, the network that I put together had a lot of trouble uh, distinguishing between these two dogs, which I think are going to really look quite similar. So I can't remember which is the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, which is the American Fit, uh, nor could my network really. It did okay. Um, but yeah, it, because they're quite similar images and they look quite similar. It would need more specific training in order to distinguish between these two breeds. Um, so when we are talking about that, we have a bit of a danger because if we get too specific with the images we feed a convolutional neural net, uh, the data can be overfitted. It can be too specific to the images looking at. So we want it to be able to be able to generalize and make assumptions not fit perfectly to the images it's trained with. So say we went back to this and we only fed it these two images for these two dog breeds. If we then ran the network, it, it would probably only identify these two breeds if it was fed that exact image. We want it to be able to be able, uh, we want it to be able to generalize and uh, make assumptions. Um, I'm now going to show a different example using Google Vision API. This is a lot less dense than what I've just been through, and it's a nice way to be able to incorporate image recognition techniques into applications that you might be making. 
So an API is um, a, a way to access a company's uh, systems. Um, in this example, Google allow you to send an image to their endpoint and it will run it through the convolutional neural network and then give you back a lot of different data based upon what they told you. In this example, I used a picture of a lion and a picture of a hippo. Um, when you clicked on them, it would make a call to Google's API and give you its predictions back. Um, so for the lion, it was very confident that this was a, a lion, but a lion. Um, and the same for the hippo, and it even told me it was a baby, which is nice. Um, you can get a huge amount more data from this. Um, there are over 20 different categories uh, that they can send back. Very easy to use. Um, and I have got an example uh, on my GitHub, which I can show you at the end if you'd like to explore this. It's very easy to get set up with. So there are some challenges with image recognition. Um, as previously mentioned, the size of the data sets needed to train something and to use can be significant, and it can take a long time to group the relevant data together. Also, we need a lot of processing power to, uh, to apply this. So graphics processing units are usually used over CPUs. Um, they have a lot more power to, with this type of thing. There are also a lot of privacy implications. Um, if you've got a lot of cameras going around identifying things, it's, it's tricky. I think it's gonna be more and more common that people understandably are worried about that. Um, it's also quite complex. U using um, a pre-trained model isn't too bad, but if you want to get more involved in it, it can get very complex very quickly. Um, another challenge, which we also mentioned, uh, the overfitting of data. You've got to make your network specific enough, but not too specific. So that can be a challenge. Um, so what does the future look like? At the moment, there are a lot of companies putting a huge amount of energy um, into research and universities as well. Um, I think it's because image recognition can be applied to so many different fields and change them very quickly. Um, yeah, all of these companies are putting a lot of money into it. Uh, Fujitsu, for example, are using uh, image recognition for uh, identifying parts. Um, uh, Google, a lot of money. Uh, Toshiba, also putting a lot of money into developing uh, automated car systems using chips. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, there are a lot of ways to get started. Um, OpenCV, which is the library I mentioned at the beginning, uh, is really good, and there are a lot of tutorials online for using that. Jupyter Notebooks, which are uh, applications online that you can store Python code in. There are a lot of examples, and I have links to one in my GitHub repository as well, if you'd like to have a look. Um, they're usually very well annotated, which means that you can kind of learn a bit about the subject. Uh, if you don't want to get too involved, uh, using APIs within your apps is a really nice way to get some really good data back. Uh, lastly, YouTube tutorials. I used quite a few of those. Um, there are some very passionate people um, about the subject, and it's a really good way to learn more, I think. So key takeaways. Um, I hope that I have been able to teach you something and maybe uh, get you interested in the subject. So image recognition has changed a lot um, since the field started, and we are now seeing a lot of machine learning based approaches and convolutional neural nets within image recognition. Uh, and there are many, many opportunities. So I think it's going to be really interesting in the next sort of five years to see what happens with it. Okay, thank you very much for listening.